Well, uh, thanks for that. Um, Mr. Zhou, do you, do you feel that the, there is a, a way for a breakthrough? Because we know where the lines are, especially on trade. You know, everyone, uh, the bilateral investment treaty takes up a lot of people's time. Everyone knows where the red lines are in each country. Can we see a blurring of that when uh, competitors but also collaborators talk honestly to each other like that? Well, certainly it helps if we, we are very honest and frank with each other. At the same time, I think it is also very important for us to understand the uh, real reason uh, behind the uh, trade deficit or imbalance between China and the United States. Uh, first and foremost, China does not have a policy to chase after trade uh, surplus with the United States or, or with any other country in the world. We want to have a balanced trade with the rest of the world, actually. And second, we want to have a do trade with the other countries on the basis of WTO rules and also international norms and international law. And that is no question about that. And thirdly, I think for China and the United States, it is very important for us to understand that this is a mutually beneficial bilateral economic and trade relationship. It benefits both China and the United States. It is not that China wins more uh, from this uh, trade relationship than the United States. Um, so can you see, sorry, my original point was, yeah. can you see a way forward or do you think it's going to be business as usual? I think that, uh, you know, at the 19th Party Congress, China has made the decision that we are going to open wider to the outside world and we will continue to reform the economic structures of the Chinese economy. So I think this is going to create a lot of opportunities for trade with the United States and with the other countries. So I think in the process of developing our own economy and with the process of integration of Chinese economy into the rest of the world, there will be more opportunities uh, for China and the United States to enhance their trade cooperation. So I think that the trade will be uh, moving towards a more balanced one between China and the United States in the future. Okay, I'd like to move to the DPRK because obviously that was the security issue, at least number one for the Trump administration on this Asia trip. After visiting two allies, of course, he went to China. Let's just um, have a listen to what Chinese President Xi Jinping said on security issues in Northeast Asia. I told President Trump that the Asia Pacific is big enough for both the U.S. and China. Both sides should increase communication and cooperation. Building the same group of friends forms constructive interactions which jointly protect and push forth regional peace and prosperity. So, Mr. Zhou, that was a, a wide look at things. Just before uh, the Trump administration left for the Asia tour, there was talk of uh, this Indo-Pacific idea, which is sort of coming out of the Trump administration of the first year. That's not something China necessarily agrees with, right? This idea of including India, Japan, Australia, uh, and the U.S. into some sort of security alliance of the democracies. Is this like a sort of containment uh, of China strategy? Uh, we have no problem with the uh, development of relations between the United States and other countries in the region or around the world, so long that relationship is conducive to peace and stability and development in the region and across the world. And so long that kind of a relationship is not directed against a third country. So I think that in this regard, China will continue to uh, develop a good relationship with Japan, uh, the Republic of Korea, Australia, India, and all the other Asian countries. And uh, at the same time, we will continue to have a good relationship with the United States. We believe that the Asia-Pacific uh, is a community for the countries in the Asia-Pacific. And uh, therefore, the matters and issues within this region should be taken care of by the countries in this region as a whole. Uh, does, uh, you know, obviously, Trump went to try and get more cooperation as, as the U.S. sees it from China on the DPRK. And in the first six to nine months of the administration, it seemed like um, Donald Trump was saying, this is China's problem to solve. Mm. And China always turned back and said, this is not our problem. Your, it's your problem between North Korea and the U.S. and, and has been uh, since uh, the, arm, uh, the armistice, but no peace in the Korean War. Do you think that, that, that China has succeeded in, in changing that narrative a little bit since the early days of the uh, Trump administration? And we didn't hear any rocket man stuff either. We didn't. I think that the uh, administration knows that this is not a problem that China alone is going to solve. Although I have to say that a solution to this problem does run through Beijing. And Solely of, through Beijing? Not just solely through Beijing, I think that's the but argument. it's one of the places. I would say that the Trump administration is very happy with the 
China joining in on the UN Security Council resolutions and the new sanctions. Uh, if you look at where we have moved on sanctions, we've done very, very well with the Chinese on this. I think that maximum pressure is working and will work on the North Koreans. And as long as the countries of Northeast Asia do this together, it's going to be a successful strategy. Uh, George Kuru, in on the West Coast, um, the West Coast has a slightly different view of the DPRK than the East Coast does, especially as their missile ranges increase. What were your views on, on any possible movement on the North Korean issue? Well, hopefully it's going to be moving in the positive direction. Um, uh, at one point, as you know, I, back at the end of the Clinton administration, um, both sides did sit down and negotiate and talk, and it was getting somewhere when the Clinton administration's time ran out, and they had to turn it over to the George W. administration, and George W. basically stopped negotiating for three years, added new additional demand uh, when, he, when he did restart in 2003, and let me remind everybody, North Korea didn't explode a first bomb until 2006. Mm. So we accuse North Korea of dealing in bad faith, but I have to think that the United States really started the whole process of tit and tat, one threat out, not out doing the, the next threat. And it's, it's leading us nowhere up to now, and hopefully we can backtrack and start rethinking about how, having a conversation. And to that extent, I think Beijing and President Xi can pro provide a very positive role. But the most important thing is President Trump and his um, staff has to be willing to sit down and talk. And based on what I hear about from Secretary Tillerson, it does sound like there may be a um, uh, unstated, unpublic discourse going mm. on leading to that particular uh, track. Joseph Pelsman, um, do you think the Trump administration are going to be ready to talk to the DPRK, whether unilaterally, bilaterally, or in some forum that, that has been established before, like the Six Party, party Talks? Do you think there is a sea change? Because we have seen a lot of different well, signals coming out of right. the White House. No, but I mean, if, and, if you and deal with it in, in terms of <coughs> the economic problem, nobody, China nor the United States, want to deal with instability. Right? Absolutely. So yeah. this is a source of instability. Now, can you get to that source of instability by choking them? Historically, no. So in terms of our own literature, none of these things work. Uh, they drive people into extreme motions. That's not and, true. No, uh, it, it uh, is. We've did, are, we did it on Iran. We've done it on uh, many well, different countries. South, it, South have, Africa. No. These sanctions have worked in many countries in the world. The only sanctions that work is if everybody on the planet agrees with the sanctions and so they have monopoly power. The only thing that the sanctions have done today is it raised the price of activity in the market. We I haven't done anything on that. Iran. No, we haven't done anything. Uh, the, Iranians, are the Iranians signed a deal after uh, we put sanctions on them. Didn't no, they? Did they sign a deal it's after a lousy the sanctions? Deal, and they got a, away with it. Well. And the idea is we've basically given them a track, basically, and we've diagrammed the path for them to create their own nuclear weapon. This is, this is absolute nonsense. Theoretically, in terms of just simple micro theory, there's none of these sanctions ever work. None. South Unless you African get sanctions didn't work only on when the, the world. Green. Only when the world. And that's what we're asking right. the world to do right Guys, now uh, on North Korea. Remind me to have you both back on the <laughs> sanctions show when we do it, because, I, because I, this is a really good debate to have. It is. Uh, but as you know, every case is different in international affairs, even though you can learn from past experience. Uh, Mr. Zhou, um, the Donald Trump also hinted at that he wanted more than just the UN resolutions when it comes to sanctions. Uh, the administration, as you know, behind the scenes of the United Nations, pushed an oil embargo. That was a no-go for many countries, including China. Would China go along with an oil embargo on the DPRK? Well, China is certainly going to shoulder its international responsibility in honoring its commitment within the, uh, uh, to the UN Security Council resolutions. But again, back to the debate that the two gentlemen had a couple of minutes ago. <laughs> Which was fascinating. Yes, yes, I agree. Well, yeah. the, uh, the UN Security Council resolutions are not just about san uh, sanctions. 
they are also about calling for peaceful negotiations right. among the parties concerned. So when we talk about comprehensive implement implementation of the UN Security Council resolutions, it means that on the one hand, we should honor the commitment, commitment about the sanction part of the resolution. And the other part, all the parties should also work together to have a peaceful negotiations on the North Korea. Because that that, that's the carrot that's never actually right. followed through with. Right. right. I mean, I'm just in terms of old history, when I first came to Washington, my job was to work on the sanctions against the Soviet Union for invading Afghanistan. We wrote to the president at that time that this isn't going to work. It's not going to work and because everybody's going to cheat. And that's exactly what everybody did. The grain embargo was a fiasco. It cost the American taxpayers right. okay. tons and tons of money. None of these things work. You need to negotiate so that they win, you win. Okay. Well, uh, you know, I think with DPRK, <laughs> you know, it, everything is different. So, but, but, so let's just uh, address that. I want to get onto something a bit broader. Because, as Jessica said in, in, in her introduction, you know, we saw President Xi, um, fresh off the 19th Party Congress, um, he's going to be another five years at least as General Secretary, his thought was incorporated into uh, the party's constitution. Um, he's, uh, he's popular in China. President Trump has got the lowest approval ratings domestically of any president in modern history. Uh, many of his staff are facing uh, perhaps legal jeopardy uh, over links with, or uh, campaign staff, legal jeopardy. Did you see that imbalance there? Of course. There's and no, what does that mean? There's no question that President Xi's political situation is much easier right now than uh, President Trump's. However, there are strengths of the American system that go beyond President Trump. The stock market is at an all-time high. Growth rates in the United States are sure, picking I mean, up. You know, Unemployment I know talking is good. Points, but, but in terms so, of, you know, in terms of uh, a leader's ability to deliver, President Trump can deliver. One of the things that the United States has is an executive-led government. And on the big issues that we're talking about, President Trump can deliver. Mr. Zhou, uh, obviously Xi Jinping, very secure and, uh, and popular. Um, China must understand where it is in the world currently, um, that it's embracing more multilateralism as the US perhaps is not. This is quite a good moment diplomatically for China compared to the US. Well, you're going to say we don't see it in zero sum terms, aren't you? But, but, but you know, <laughs> you know, you're you know what I'm <laughs> well, I, you know, Let's try and get beyond that a little bit. But, but we truly believe in that because we don't think that there is actually a vacuum left over by the United States in the world. We believe that the new international situation actually really calls for greater cooperation uh, among big powers of the world, China, the United States, and European countries and the other major economies of the world. Because these problems, the challenges in the 21st century are on a global scale, and therefore they call for global cooperation, especially China and the United States. So we are not taking advantage of any uh, assumed problems in the United States. What we want is that we can work together. We are talking about the revitalization of the Chinese nation, and President Trump is talking about America first. And we understand, and he has explained, that America first does not mean America exclusive and, uh, or America only. So it means that both China and the United States, the leaders, are focused pretty much on the domestic agenda, developing our respective economies. And China, I think fir that China first, too, you mean? Is China first and America first? <laughs> well, for every government in the world, the number one opportunity is to create a better life for its own people, and that has been stated by our president. And Donald Trump said it um, very clearly too, as well, that he respects that. And uh, um, you know, there's been a lot of focus also on um, the welcome that uh, President Trump got. I mean, the Forbidden City is an incredible place, not least at sunset, and then you get to see selections from the Peking Opera. I mean, it was just wonderful uh, visit, um, but also. President Trump sort of brought his own personal stamp as well. His granddaughter, Arabella, right. who, as we know, uh, sort of was at the Mar-a-Lago summit, mm -hmm. um, had this song, a uh, Chinese song. Let, let's just ha have a little listen to it. <laughs> Ada. 
Uh, Mr. Zhou, that's called our fields, right? Is that something Chinese people recognize? And how's this resonating with China on the sort of personal diplomacy of the Trump family? I think every people of my generation recognize that song. I learned that song when I was an elementary uh, student, a school student, and it's called Our Field. It talked about the future, the, uh, the wonderful future of our uh, countryside, of our country. So it is a very beautiful song. And uh, most of the Chinese would uh, love that. And I think that, uh, well, that she's pretty sweet and cute girl. <laughs> and she's singing that song as a friendly gesture uh, to the Chinese. And, and the Chinese people really love her, really love that. And I think uh, that has been uh, well received. It's a very, very uh, friendly gest gesture. Councillor Cho, thanks so much. You know, it shows that cultural diplomacy matters as well as all this hard bargain as well. I, I wish we could talk more, but that's all we've got time for. Thanks so much for uh, the panel here and out in California. That's it for this edition of The Heat. Tune in again. I'm Nathan King in Washington, D.C. Thanks so much for being with us.